dive into the living waters of the Word of God on So Says the Lord with Sherry Hales Ministries, where we're learning, living, loving. Now here's your host, Bible teacher, minister, author, Sherry Hales. Well, welcome. Peace, love, and joy to you and your family. I'm so happy you decided to join me today on So Says the Lord with Sherry Hells Ministries, where we're learning, living, and loving. So let's dive right into the refreshing living waters of the Word of God. So we here at Sherry Hells Ministries have been doing a three-part ministry series entitled The God Series. We are looking at God in three separate segments, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We recently wrapped up the God the Father segment and we focused on names of God in that segment. Now we are on to God the Son and we will be looking at titles of Jesus found in the Bible. Today we will look at Son of Man. The title Son of Man as applied to Jesus informs us that Jesus, although he was God, he was also a man. He was a son of man, which informs us that he was born of a woman, as all men are. Son of man is the title that Jesus frequently used when referring to himself. And the term is seen in both the Old and the New Testament. Now the series focus scripture for this entire series, all three segments, is found in 1 John 5, 7 to 8. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The series forethought. So what do we hope to gain as a result of this series? So God is a triune being, Father, Son, Spirit. He made us in His image and likeness, body, soul, spirit. As we learn about the triune nature of God, we will also learn about the triune nature of man, and in doing so, we will gain a more effective and fulfilling walk of faith. So the scriptures that I will be looking at for this title, Son of Man, will be John 3, 4 to 15. If you're going to follow along with me, you can grab your Bible now. I will be looking at the King James Version of the Bible, but whatever version you have is fine. Now, every series we do here at Sherry Hills Ministries has two separate components, a Bible teaching component followed by a Bible study component. If you want to also uh, join us for the Bible study, if you want to dive a little deeper into the Word of God, you would also read Luke 7, 18 to 35. Visit my website, www.sherryhillsministries.org. There you will find information about how you can participate in the Bible study. And if this ministry is being a blessing to you, feel free to sow a seed or partner with us and help us to advance the Word of God. So, I hope you have your Bible by now. So... Now, I will also be giving um, an overview before I actually get into the scripture. So, an overview for Son of Man. So, the title, Son of Man, informs us that Christ was indeed a man and further that he was born of a woman, as I already said. Now, Genesis 3, 14 to 15 tells us, that as a result of the serpent deceiving Eve so that she ate of the forbidden fruit, God cursed the serpent and told him the serpent, which was the devil using uh, the serpent, but it was really the devil who was responsible for this. He, told the de he, to he cursed the serpent and he, um, told him that he would put enmity between him and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So bruise thy head is talking about power. So it's talking about 
the seed of woman will destroy the power of the devil. And then it says, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Bruise his heel is what happened to Christ when he was crucified on the cross. It bruised his heel. This verse is referred to as the pro protevangelium. Protevangelium. In other words, it is the first reference of a coming redeemer in the Bible. This promise was fulfilled by the Son of Man, Jesus the Christ. And so I'm going to, uh, again, the scripture um, will be John 3, 4 to 15. That's what we'll be looking at today. So, it simply says, <clears throat> Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and he was a religious leader and teacher of that day. And so here in verse 4, uh, John 3 verse 4, Nicodemus saith unto him, he's talking to Jesus. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So Nicodemus, again, he was a Pharisee. He was a religious leader um, in Israel. And he had gone to Jesus to ask him questions about the teachings that Jesus had um, been um, teaching the people. And so Nicodemus wondered, what did it mean to be born again? And he's saying, can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So this is the question. So Nicodemus was, again, a religious leader. He was a teacher himself um, of the law. He was a teacher. And so this statement by Christ intrigued him and confused him. He did not know what does it mean to be born again. Now, he knew what it means to be born into the world but Jesus is saying born again so Nicodemus wondered what exactly does this statement mean then verse 5 Jesus answered verily verily I say unto thee except a man be born of water and of the spirit he cannot enter into the kingdom of God so Christ is telling Nicodemus, this is his answer. Verily, verily, or truly, truly, or surely, surely, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So born of water, when, when people are born, they are born from water. There is water that is surrounding them. Um, within the womb. So born of water. Christ is, Christ is now talking about natural birth and spiritual birth. So in other words, he's saying, first a man has to be born. When a person is born, he, he, is, he qualifies. In other words, human beings qualify to enter into the kingdom of God. So he's saying, except a man be born of water and of the spirit. So he's saying the first birth is the natural birth. After the natural birth, he also has to have a spiritual birth. Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh, here Jesus is further clarifying, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's born of the water, flesh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So first he's talking about being born, the natural birth process. He says it here. He says born of the flesh. And then he's now he's talking about being born of the spirit, which is something that has to do with our spiritual nature. And so Christ is clarifying what he's talking about. Verse 7, marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. So Jesus is saying, don't. Don't be confused um, by this. 
Don't, don't let this statement confuse you. Now, Jesus had already explained in the prior verse of what he meant. He broke it down clearer. In verse 6, and he said, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, verse 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. So now Jesus is further taught. He's still um, trying to answer Nicodemus and help him to understand um, what he is actually talking about. So again, born of the flesh is the actual event, an actual event that is a visible and tangible event. When, when a person is born of, a, of the flesh, you can see them. You can see their flesh. You can see them. And then Jesus, Jesus is breaking this down. He's trying to explain the question. Then he says, um, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it, it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Jesus is trying to contrast this to natural birth. He says, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it, and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Now later, when the Holy Spirit would actually come, because it had not come yet, it did say that it, it, it again likened the Spirit to a wind. And it talked about the sound. It talked about there was a sound as of a rushing mighty wind. Jesus is talking about spiritual birth in contrast to natural birth. That is what he is talking about here. So, born of the flesh, again, this is an actual event that is visible and tangible. Born of the Spirit is an actual event that is invisible, just like the wind. It is an, it is, it is an event. It is an actual event. However, it is not visible or perceivable with the eye. But it can be heard. So, in uh, at Pentecost, there was a, a, a sound of a rushing mighty wind. And then there was another sound. It said it filled the room and the people there began to speak in other tongues. That is the sound of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that that is a sign that a person is filled with the Holy Spirit, that they are able to speak with new tongues and now verse number nine Nicodemus answered and said unto him how can these things be so Nicodemus again he is in his religious mind he's in his religious mind and he's still the his religion was all based on natural things and so, because the, mo the law of Moses dealt with natural things, Jesus is ushering in a different religion, for lack of a better word. He is, in he is ushering in a spiritual experience with God, um, as opposed to um, relating to God in the natural so Nicodemus is he is struggling with this concept because his um, in his mind he has always dealt with the natural things and the natural things are the things that relate to a relationship with God but now Jesus is talking about the wind 
And he's, he's, he's talking about this birth that's going to happen that is spiritual. And he is relating it to the wind. So Nicodemus is very confused. Verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? So now Jesus is actually saying to him, Have you been studying? He's, he's saying, so in other words, Nicodemus was, was stuck on the natural. However, there were prophecies about the coming Messiah. There were prophecies that could have helped Nicodemus to grasp what Christ was now talking about. So he's, Christ is saying, but aren't you one of the leaders leading the people? He's saying, art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? So in other words, he's saying, but Nicodemus, you, you should know if you are a, you have been teaching the people, this is something that you really should know. Verse 11, verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen. And ye receive not our witness. So Jesus is now telling him. He's saying. I'm telling you. I'm telling you things that are true. Um, but you haven't been receiving. So Jesus is now talking about. I guess prior. Um, situations where he. Had where he was um, interacting with Nicodemus, maybe personally, or maybe he was just speaking, and Nicodemus was in the in the crowd. But he's saying, "We," he said, "I say unto thee, we speak that we do know." So Jesus is saying, "This is confusing to you, but I'm telling you what I know. We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen." And ye receive not our witness. So he's saying, apparently there have been things that Jesus had been saying. And, and we know that there was pushback from the Pharisees and the Sadducees as Jesus was teaching. They were opposing him at every point. And so Jesus is saying, I've been telling you these things. And, and you are basically not wanting to receive it. Verse 12. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? So Jesus is saying, you know, I've been, I've been saying things and I've been relating things to earthly things to help you clearly get an image in your mind of what I'm telling you. And you don't understand that. So now, now you come to me with this question asking me what is spiritual birth? And Jesus is say, saying, I'm telling you about natural things. I've been telling you about natural things and you don't grasp that. So how are you going to grasp if you cannot grasp things of the nature, natural things that you have um, direct experience with? How are you going to understand spiritual things? Verse 13, and no man hath ascended up to heaven. But he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. So here, Jesus is, this is where, um, why I'm focusing in on this uh, passage of scripture. Because here is where we find that title, uh, and in many other places as well. But here we find that title where Jesus is calling himself even the Son of Man which is in heaven and, and it says and no man hath ascended up to heaven but he that came down from heaven so he's he's now revealing something to Nicodemus he's saying I came down from heaven that's what Jesus is basically saying to him and no man hath ascended up to heaven but he that came down from heaven even the son of man which is in heaven heaven so Jesus is saying he came down from heaven and then verse 14 and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the son of man be lifted up he calls himself the son of man twice and so um Moses in um 
in Exodus, it talks about Moses lifting up a bronze serpent, a serpent. So the serpent, um, let's see, I wrote down Moses lifted a bronze serpent. A bronze serpent is representing sin that has been judged and dealt with. So bronze is representative of sin that has been judged and dealt with. And Christ is, is contrasting this to an event to, that is to come to take place when he is crucified. He is saying, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, he's saying also, he's saying this, the serpent was lifted up. He's saying, even so, must the son of man be lifted up. So Jesus is, is telling Nicodemus a lot of things right here. Um, he's telling him that he, he, he told him he came down from heaven. And now he's saying he has to be lifted up like the uh, serpent that Moses lifted up. And the serpent was representing sin that had been judged and dealt with bronze. Rep is, um, re um, bronze is representative of sin that has been judged and dealt with. Now Christ would also be lifted up on the cross. And the sins of humanity as a result of his act would be judged and dealt with because of what Christ did. Christ took our sins upon himself and they were counted, judged and dealt with. They were not, humanity did not get away with, with, with um, they did not get a, a free pass on sin. It was paid for. Jesus paid the price for the sins of humanity. And verse six, uh, 17, I'm sorry, verse 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so there it is. Jesus is telling us as the son of man, he's telling us that he was the son of man. The son of man is tied back directly to um, the prophecy that was, or what G, what God said um, in Genesis when he when he said, um, let's see, he said, as a result of the serpent tricking Eve, so that she ate the forbidden fruit, God cursed him. And told the serpent, the devil, that he would put enmity or dislike or hatred between him and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. The seed of woman is the son of man. Because all men come forth from a woman. And so, Jesus, the son of man. He is also the seed of woman. And so is the son of man. And Jesus says it right here. In this, he's saying, he said, um, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is, well, let me go back to 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So Jesus was talking about the act of crucifixion. That whole act that he went through is what provided the answer um, to sin. Jesus is the one. And in that act, that is when he crushed the devil's head. That's when the crushing took place is when he was on the cross because he took back the power of death, hell, and the grave from the enemy and it bruised his heel because on that cross, as he was suffering on that cross for the sins of humanity, his heel was rubbing up against the, the, uh, the, um, the wood on the cross and his heel was being bruised and terribly bruised because all of his pressure the pressure of his body was on was was you know pressed down um, towards his 
the heel of his feet. And so his heel would have been terribly bruised. And so the Son of Man. So this is what the Son of Man looks at. And so this is what the Son of Man um, is, is, is telling us. Now there are many scriptures in the Bible about the Son of Man. And, um, you know, and if you do want to dive even deeper into, um, you know, into the Word of God, again, visit my into the son of man this title visit my website www.sherryhillsministries.org it will tell you how to participate in the bible study portion and also read luke 7 18 to 35 luke 7 18 to 35 well i pray that you have enjoyed today's bible study about the Son of Man, um, as we are looking at uh, God the Son. And I pray that your body, soul, and spirit has been refreshed in the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you peace. Until the next time, be blessed and walk with God. Mr. Sherry Hills, and I'm excited about my new television show, So Says the Lord, with Sherry Hills Ministries on Preach the Word Network. Be sure to tune in and watch So Says the Lord with Sherry Hills Ministries on Preach the Word Network, where we're learning, living, loving. And be sure to continue to support this wonderful television network. For TV distribution, visit us online, www.ptwwntv.com.